Good morning. My name is Shalane Bird, and it is a privilege once again to join with you in worship. We are standing here in the sanctuary of Mountain Brook Presbyterian Church, but I am fully aware that people are looking at me and listening to me and experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit along with me in communities far from here. So wherever you find yourself right now, whether it's at the kitchen table, the couch, the office, or the car, know that I give thanks for your presence, and I believe that when two or more are gathered, indeed, Christ is with us. I invite you to join with me in our call to worship. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. My friends, happy All Saints Sunday. Let us join together in an opening prayer. Eternal God, neither death nor life can separate us from your love. Grant that we may serve you faithfully here on earth, and in heaven rejoice with all your saints who ceaselessly proclaim your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. And all the people say together, Amen. Friday uh, morning and the sun is shining beautiful after we had the little 
uh, stormy weather, and I hope everyone is okay and your power is back on or will be back on soon. He has removed our sins as far away from us as the east is from the west. And that's Psalms 103, 12. Look at that strange sign, Ben. One sign is pointing east and one is pointing west. I'm confused. Which way are we supposed to go? That sign is to show us how far our sins have been taken away from us. The sign is in the shape of a cross to remind us that Jesus died to take our sins away forever. Thomas, do you know where east starts and where east ends? Well, I guess I never thought about it much. Let's see. East is in that direction, but it has no beginning. West is in that direction, but it has no beginning or end either. So that makes east and west very far apart from each other, doesn't it? Oh yes, very far, Thomas. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I don't know how far east is from west, but I know that it's far enough for you to never to remember my sin. Even if I should remember some of the sins I've done, I know that you won't find them or even remember them, not a single one. Lord, if there's any sin in my heart right now, please take it away, far, far away. Amen. To all the saints out there, the good news that you already know, but which we need to be reminded of is this, that God loves you just as you are, just as you were born, right where you are, God knows the number of hairs on your head. We also know in the gospel of Jesus that God loves us so much that God doesn't always, always let us stay just like that. We are always growing in Christ. With that in mind, I invite you to join with me in our prayer of confession. Eternal God, in every age you have raised up men and women to live and die in faith. We confess that we are indifferent to your will. You call us to proclaim your name, but we are silent. You call us to do what is just, but we remain idle. You call us to live faithfully, but we are afraid. In your mercy, forgive us. Give us courage to follow in your way that joined with those from ages past who have served you with faith, hope, and love, we may also inherit the kingdom you promised in Jesus Christ. Let us take a moment as we lift up our prayers and our own confessions to God. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. God's mercy was there long before the very first yesterday. And God's love extends long past the very farthest tomorrow. Right here and now, please know that because of the God we know in Jesus Christ, we are a people forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Though we're recording on Thursday, today for you is November the 1st. It's the day after Halloween. Now I don't know this for sure, but I suspect that if you have kids or grandkids uh, in your care in any way, that they are fully aware this Halloween is a bit different than previous ones. The rumor on the street is that trick-or-treating is off this year, so I guess November 1st I'll find out if that was true. The truth of the matter is there's a lot of things that feel off these days. If you are like many, many people with whom I am in contact and people I care about, 
You may have been in quarantine for quite a long time now, staying at home as much as you can, maybe even getting groceries and prescription medicines delivered, wearing masks when you have to leave your home, doing some things that we never even considered a year ago. We are, as you know, living in a once-in-a-century pandemic. It is a first for almost every single person alive. We know well that at least as of the day of this recording, we are now grieving the loss of over 227,000 deaths. And we know that means that there are countless families, siblings, children, co-workers, neighbors, grieving those people. As time goes by, there are fewer and fewer of us who have not been impacted by the illness or the death of someone we know. We see on both a micro and a macro level our economies in various levels of volatility and struggle. We see businesses in our communities, both large and small, some struggling, some failing. Those of us with kids are aware of the changes in schools, schools who have decided to remain closed, and schools who have gone to extensive lengths to create policies and procedures to try and keep our children safe as they do return. We're also aware that the rates of unemployment have continued to rise, with parents struggling, single parents in particular, as they are not always sure how to balance childcare as well as maintaining a career. We see, as I read in an article a few days ago, a significant decline in overall mental health. We see now statistically significant increases in rates of suicide, drug relapse and overdose, and uh, a domestic, <clears throat> domestic violence. We know, friends, that there will be a vaccine that will help arm us against this deadly pandemic, and it will come, but it is not going to come today. On top of that, we are two days now away from what is arguably the most highly divisive election in our modern history. We're citizens of a country that is divided in many ways now, and we find ourselves distrustful. And like you, I have opinions about all of that, but now is not the time for those. Now is the time to acknowledge that no matter how we stand on some of these issues, we are in quite an ordeal, an ordeal for saints and sinners alike. I want to read for you today a text that grabbed my attention because it's a text that talks about an ordeal, and not just an ordeal, a great ordeal. Hear now the words from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood round the throne and round the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne. And they worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. And then he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within this temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more. They will thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a buzzword I've been hearing a lot lately. Perhaps you have too. Pandemic fatigue. That's a thing I'm seeing online, I'm hearing on the news, and if I'm honest, it's something I can relate to. In fact, I have found myself going through some of the stages of what I believe to be grief. Sometimes I feel angry, and sometimes I feel sad or numb. Sometimes I'm in denial that all of these changes in the world are even happening. And all of that, according to the people who talk about pandemic fatigue, all of that's normal. Perhaps you're feeling some of that as well. Because the truth is that this is indeed a season that is testing the resolve of each one of us. So if you find yourself tired, and you're not exactly sure why, please know, friends, on this All Saints Sunday, that you are not the only saint feeling that way. Pandemic fatigue is a real thing, and I wonder if it's not partly because everything, whether it's grocery shopping, or carpool, or attending worship, or going to the doctor for a checkup, or filling up our car with gas, or you name it. Every single little thing seems more complicated than it was before. And that's not just us who have ever felt that. The truth is, we're not the only ones who felt like we're in the midst of a real ordeal. The text that we find here in Revelation talks about a great ordeal. The actual Greek, because you know me, I've got to go back to the Greek. The Greek is philipsis, and the actual translation is tribulation. So we would be saying that we relate to these people who have come out of the great tribulation. Historically, we know what's happening or what has happened with these folks. These are people who were exiled from their homeland. They were removed forcibly from all things that were familiar. And they found themselves being forced to live in a strange land. And I can only imagine that they had the same kind of fatigue. Nothing seemed familiar, not the songs, not the culture, not the food, not even the smells. Nothing felt like home. The great tribulation. And see, in the midst of this historic exile, they began to feel as if this, this feeling of chaos, of things not going right, of nothing feeling like it used to, as if it was going to just go on, not just tomorrow, but that feeling of things not being right was gonna go on and on and on because they didn't know when and if they would ever go home again. So this chaos felt like it might continue indefinitely. And the people referenced in this text began to dream they began to think about the future and what could be. Again, not just what could be the next day or the day after that, but at the end of all days, they began, as many of us do, to rely on their faith. The vision that we find in Revelation is a wonderful illustration of the hopes and dreams of these people. 
The author of this text is reminding the people of the promises of their God. And if we look at the text itself, the promises are absolutely breathtaking. These words in Revelation promise these people, these tired, fatigued, exhausted people, that one day, one day, you will come out of the great ordeal. The text says that one day you will be part of a great multitude, so great that no one could count. And here's why that's important. It's the promise that one day you will not be alone. One day you will be with other people, other people who were exiled like you, sent to far away foreign lands. One day you will be with your loved ones. One day you will be with the saints of the past, with your mother and your father, your grandmother, your grandfather, the people who still had memories of their motherland. And one day you will be with the saints of the present, the people you know are out there but you haven't seen in such a long time. One day you will be also with the saints of the future, with those children running around out in the yard, or perhaps the kicking that you feel deep in the womb. One day you will all be together. That is a holy promise of this text. And then it continues. Because the people are promised not only that they would be together, but they would be with God. Revelations says that they would fall on their faces before the throne and they would worship God together, singing together. And finally, and this is the promise that really gets me, this is, this is what made me need to study this text today and want to share it with all the saints. This fourth promise that God makes to these people, these weary, weary, exiled people, is that God not only will be with them, and not only will they be together, not only will they no longer be afraid or feeling lonely, but that God will provide for all of their needs. And if you are, as many good Presbyterians might be doing out there, looking at the page in your Bible, look at the words and see how it looks in many ways, like the language of Psalm 23, the text says that God will shelter them, that they will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will never strike them again as they work out in the heat. That God, the Lamb on the throne, will be their shepherd, guiding them to springs of holy water. And finally, that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And I know that I have been with many people who have tears in their eyes. And those tears are there for lots of reasons. All of these many generations ago, God promised that every tear would be wiped away. And the truth is, friends, that I think this text also speaks to us in a way that it might not in other years. It spoke to me in a way that it hasn't before, because I believe that God continues to promise us that God will wipe away every tear. And it's not surprising at all that we too, we weary, pandemic, fatigued Presbyterians, find ourselves looking to the future. It's no wonder that I get emails from the schools talking about all of their good-intentioned long-range planning. I get emails from businesses promising that soon they're going to be reopening and wanting commitments that we will continue to go and shop there. It's no wonder that we spend so much time and energy preparing for this election. We are thinking about the future. And to bring it on home, it's no wonder that even in our families, we find ourselves looking forward and trying to make plans just recently, my family was trying to think about Thanksgiving and how in the world that will work out this year. 
and how and whether we can bring together family members from all over Florida and Alabama and Wisconsin, people from the age of two all the way up to 95. How can we do that safely? And the truth, of course, is that we can't, not safely, and so we won't. But we keep coming back to it and we keep talking about how wonderful it would be if we could sit together at table with one another. If we could see one another eye to eye again. Because we are tired of being alone. Like saints of the past, we find ourselves in the midst of a great ordeal. And I would be lying to you if I stood here and said that any of us know for sure when and how it will end. That is part of what makes the fatigue so real. But as people of faith, we know that the future is a future that is already being created by God. We know that as it was in the beginning, the very beginning, so it will be in the end, the end of this pandemic, the end of my days, the end of all days, the end. And in that end, the final word does not belong to any illness or election or strife. The final word does not belong to me or you. It doesn't belong to the saints of long ago, nor those precious saints of tomorrow. And friends, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, hear, hear me please, that the final word does not, it does not belong to death. The final word belongs to God the God that we already know in Jesus Christ, the God who chose to come and join us, not just in the good times, but the hard times, especially the hard times, the times like now. The final word belongs to God, the God by whom we are known from head to toe. Down to the number of hairs on your head, God knows you. And knowing that I am known as you are, and knowing that we are loved as we are, reminds me of the words of a Christian mystic whose, who, <clears throat> whose words have comforted saints for generations now. The final word belongs to God, and that word is life. And because I know that, I can quote here saying that all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. I pray this to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
read from Revelation is a passage that talks about eschatology, the end of all that is seen and unseen. And in that passage, we read about the saints gathering, saints of all time and place, before the throne of God. And the imagery there is beautiful. But I want to tell you that it's not the only way for us to think about gathering together. Friends, we gather together right here at this table. And on this Sunday, I invite you, wherever you are, to participate in this holy sacrament called the Lord's Supper. It's important before we begin to remember that this table here in this sanctuary does not belong to this church. It doesn't belong to this presbytery, and you already know it doesn't belong to me. This table and any table around which we gather to commune with Christ belongs to Christ. And Jesus promises and instructs everyone who trusts in him, and only you know what that means, to come and partake in this feast. I invite you to join with me in our prayer of great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is it right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. We praise you for saints and martyrs, for the faithful of it in every age who have followed your Son and witnessed to his resurrection, people from every race and tongue, from every people and nation, you have gathered them into your kingdom. You have shown them the path of life and filled them with the joy of your presence. How glorious is your heavenly realm where the multitude of your saints rejoice with Christ. And so therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with the saints of all time and all place, who forever sing to the glory of your name, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Sent to be our Savior, he took our flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. His words are true, and his touch brings healing. To all who follow him, he gives us abundant life. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Holy One, we gather around this table. And on this All Saints Sunday, we have so many prayers to lift to you. We lift up to you, aloud or in silence, the names of the people, the men, the women, the children, who are no longer with us physically, but whose life impacted us and helped mold and change our faith. We give you thanks for the saints of old. Here are now their names. Thankful for the saints of old, and grateful also for the young ones in our midst, who are the saints of the future. Holy One, as we prepare for this meal, we know that we gather as saints and sinners alike. And Holy One, we know that in truth we are both. And so we pray this prayer with humility. We pray the prayers for which we do not yet have words, prayers that come out as sighs or sometimes laughter. And we pray it to you in the name of Jesus Christ, for he is the one who taught us how to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and after giving thanks to God for it, he broke it, and he gave it to all the disciples, saying, See, this is my body, and it is broken for you. Whenever you eat this, remember me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of all sin. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. All you saints, whenever we eat this bread and whenever we drink this cup, we remember the death of Jesus until he comes again and come again he will. And I'm telling you, as one saint and sinner both, until that great day comes, this remains for us gifts of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Body of Christ, broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Friends, this is the body of Christ broken for us. This is the blood of Christ spilled for you. Blood of Christ for you. Friends, this is the very cup of salvation for us. Join with me in a word of prayer. Number us among your saints, O God, and join us with the faithful of every age, that strengthened by their witness and supported by their fellowship, we may run with perseverance the race that is set before us, and may with them receive the unfading crown of glory when we stand before your throne of grace. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when, with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.
whether we gather before the throne of God one day, or whether we are gathering around this simple, powerful table today, know that Christ has called you, and Christ has fed you. God has filled you with courage, and now God sends you. And as you go to be the saint that only you can be, know that it is my prayer for you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of God's Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and for all our days together. God bless you. Amen.